afternoon, good morning. I don't know yet. Oh, there we go. Uh, I am in a remote location, so hopefully my phone connection stays good throughout this. If I drop off, I'll call back in. So thank you, Lori, for inviting me to talk a little bit about our project we completed last March, where we're looking at the effect of chlorine dioxide and heat treatment technologies for structural decon of viruses and bacteria. We specifically wanted to do the testing under challenging conditions uh, that would be fall and winter conditions, which we got, you'll see here in a second, uh, the average outdoor temperature swung widely. We had everything from blue skies and sunshine to winter conditions with snow and 30 degree temperatures. So this is a joint project between EPA and Sabre companies. Sabre companies uh, has been doing chlorine dioxide fumigation for many years. We entered into what's called a cooperative research and development agreement with them to perform this work. Going to slide number two. <clears throat> the facility we tested at was hit by HPAI last year. There were several barns that required treatment. These barns had been depopulated and treated in fall of last year and had sat dormant through spring of this year, and that's when we did our testing. This barn here is identical to the barn on the other side. This one was fumigated here with chlorine dioxide, and the one on the opposite side was for heat treatment. These are located in Eagle Grove, Iowa. As I mentioned before, they've been depopulated. I'm not sure if they would repopulated these yet, but I, they were slated to be repopulated this summer, this, sometime this past summer. The barns, the reason we're interested is because these barns are very large. We're interested in large structural fumigation, mainly for bioagents. The division I'm with focuses on CBRN. And corn dioxide is one of our fumigants of choice for cleaning up uh, anthracis. So we were very interested in seeing this effect on this side of the barn as well as the heat treatment because the uh, heat treatment also works for other things such as Ebola. These barns are roughly 600 feet long, 50 feet wide, and then three stories. They have the manure pit, the cage level, and then an attic section. Going to the next slide is a side profile of the barns. You can see the manure pit down on the bottom, the cage level in the middle, and then the attic. The typical airflow is up through the eaves, down through the cage level, and down through the manure pit, which are exhausted. For our heat treatment testing, we did the opposite direction. So each of those vent holes you see on the bottom, there were 24, 800,000 B2 an hour heaters hooked up along the length of the barn where air was pushed in the bottom up through the cage level and then exhausted through the cap vent on the barn. The eaves had been sealed up with plastic to trap the heat in and force it out through the ridge vent. So there were five layers, five cages, levels, or not levels, uh, rows of cages in each of these barns. Uh, very long facilities to get across to the other row. We had to cross all the way down to the end and come back up the other side. Going to the next slide. The objectives of our testing were to compare the seven-day heat treatment process to the chlorine dioxide fumigation process. We fumigated for about a day, but there are also several days of setup and preparation, so it's not fair to say it takes one day to do chlorine dioxide treatment. It really takes several days of prep, fumigating, and then several days of tearing down. Uh, the heat treatment process was 100 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit for seven days, three of those being consecutive, where the clock starts ticking once you get back up to temperature again. We did not have any trouble holding that temperature with this amount of heaters. I thought with the amount of concrete and thermal sink we had down there would have trouble. But what we did see, there were cold spots in certain parts of the barn, mainly down in the manure pit, the center level and the upper level. We had no problem hitting 120. We did have to throttle back on some of our heaters, so we didn't overtemp the barn and do structural damage. That was one thing we were concerned about. Our goal for the chlorine dioxide treatment was five hours at 5,000 ppm, which would give us a 25,000 ppm hour. We did have a hard time achieving the 5,000 ppm due to the organic load inside the barn. What you'll see is a reaction between the chlorine dioxide and then the organic matter and decreases your concentration. We got to about 12 or 13 hours and we're concerned we're going to run out of chemical. So they actually had a truck headed back up to Iowa from Oklahoma with additional chemical in case we didn't have another 25,000. which is typically 75 degrees F and 75% RH. Uh, we used four of the Sunbelt heaters to get our temperature up and to get our RH up inside the barn to the low dew point that time of year. 
we had a steamer tanker from the oil field brought in from Colorado, and we put in several thousand, I think it was on the order of 8,000 gallons of water into the facility. So there was a little bit of water condensation in the bottom of the manure pit at the end of the testing. We looked at two surrogates. One was a spore former, which was subtilis, and we inoculated 10 to the 7th on coupons, and I'll show you what the coupon materials are here in a second, and bacteriophage, MS2 bacteriophage, which is a surrogate for HPAI. We took six different coupon materials or reference materials. Coupons are roughly half-inch square material swatches of galvanized steel, black iron, high-density polyethylene, pine wood, canvas, and concrete materials you typically find in a barn. And then we inoculated those with the cellular spores, was the MS2, on two different types of surfaces, clean surfaces, which is basically new materials, as well as soil surfaces. So we took chicken feces mixed with paraffin and coated the substrate and then applied the two different surrogates on top of that. And then those coupons were and closed in tieback envelopes, and that's what were placed throughout the facilities. Five locations in each barn for each of the subtlest, as well as the bacterial phase. We also have biological indicators placed throughout there. And those are typically what we put in our fumigations to determine whether the fumigant got to that specific location when it activated and that the, the fumigant reached that specific location. Going to the next slide, this shows what our reference material coupons look like. The clean materials on the left and the soiled on the right. You can see the soiled application on top of the coupons compared to the clean substrates. And then the two surrogates were inoculated on top of those and then placed in Tyvek. Next slide is the placement of the biological indicators. You can see a person pushing a car down the middle of the barn. And then what they put out of the easels you see in the right photo. Red, blue are the two material reference coupons. And then the spore strips are the easels on the far right in that photo. And then the red and blue show the different locations on the manure pit level as well as the cage level placement of the coupons. At each of those locations, we also had a temperature sensor. And then in the fumigation barn at each of those locations is where a gas sample was pulled for the chlorine dioxide concentration. Going to the next slide is a photo of the heat treatment process with the Sunbelt heaters located along the manure pit level of the barn. And then inside the fan ducts, we stretched in polyethylene tubes, which distributed the heat across the lower level of the manure barn, and then blew the heat up to the cage level and then eventually exhausted. Going to the next slide, it shows the direct and remote temperature observations. So I mentioned earlier that we had temperature monitoring going on in each of the coupon locations. EPA also placed out roughly 40 hobos in the heat treatment barn. A hobo is just a data temperature logger, temperature and RH logger. We do not get real-time measurements like we did at each of the coupon locations. So we logged the temperature and RH and then we can plot that data later for comparison to the real-time measurements. Sunbelt also had Temperature and RH sensors inside each of the barns. I think it was roughly 12 to 16 in each of the barns so they can monitor the temperature and then adjust the temperature as needed. We also went in there periodically. You can see the person on the right in Tyvek taking temperature measurements to verify what the sensors were saying. During those times, we would point out uh, different cold spots, primarily on the, the manure level of the barns and the corners and so forth where there were the heat duct wasn't stretching all the way into those specific corners. And so those would be areas of concern if we're trying to treat the entire facility and keeping it up to the 100 degree temperature range. Going to the next slide shows the real-time chlorine dioxide monitoring. Those yellow, the yellow line you see, the gas line you see hanging down on the left side of the photo, that was a gas sampling point. One of the issues with chlorine dioxide is that there are no real-time monitors. So you have to take an extractive gas sample, pull a gas sample through those lines, which means pulling it roughly at a minimum of 300 feet and, at worst case, probably six, 700 feet back to the sampling trailer. So you can see the sample pumps and rotometers on that right side photo. And one of the issues you may run into is somebody stepped on your line or it got bent or, or crimped that he would not be able to get a gas sample, which happened in one, one of the cases. And so we had a short line 
pulled to the side of the barn, so we have redundancy, and you have to go out on the side of the, the barn and pull a gas sample and take it back and titrate it. So you back titrate the gas sample to determine what your chlorine dioxide concentration is, and you do that roughly every 15 minutes at each of the sample locations. So you're very busy during the whole fumigation process determining what your chlorine dioxide concentration is inside the barn. Next slide shows the barn encapsulated or tented. Uh, we had fairly decent weather for the most part, but right before we were scheduled to tent the facility, we got a snowstorm with uh, roughly two inches of snow <laughs> coming through. And the tending crew is out of Miami. They specialize in structural fumigation for termites. So these young guys came up from Miami with very little uh, clothing for the <laughs> harsh Iowa conditions of the wintertime. And then to top it off, we had snow on top of the barn. So we had to delay our tending process for about a day until the snow melted. We couldn't put people up on top to just stretch out those tarps. So each of these tarps, you can see, sort of see the seams if you blow up your, your view a little bit. There are several seams along the whole length of that barn. Each of those has to be rolled and clipped. So the, one of the issues with coin dioxide is putting the tarps up on the entire facility and then basically sealing up those different joints so the gas cannot escape. One thing that Saber was looking at was a better system of stretching, a, say, a 600-foot tarp where you raise it up on a like a large carpet roll where they could just roll it off of the roll, drop it down, and then seal it up at the bottom. So each of these tarps is roughly, I think, about 40 to 50 feet wide, and then they go several hundred feet long. But they had to roll and clip, and then they encapsulate the entire facility to keep the gas inside. The lower left part of that slide shows a gas emitter. So Sabre's process is they generate liquid chlorine dioxide using sodium hypochlorite and sodium chloride. So it's all generated in the field. Mix up, dropped into that red vessel you see there, which is called the emitter. And then they blow a tremendous amount of gas through a gas liquid stripper, and that's what's emitted into the facility. The system they were using is the Generation 8, which is a, a semi-trailer you see in the lower part. They can transport a certain amount of chemical in the back of this generator, but for the most part, they have a separate semi filled full of chemicals. So it's a mini chemical plant. Mix everything up. This Generation 8 can generate about 25,000 pp, 25,000 pounds of chlorine dioxide per hour. So they can go through a lot of chemical. They can do so. Each of these barns is roughly a million cubic feet, slightly less, maybe 900,000 a million cubic feet. They can generate up to about 17, or they can do about 17 million cubic feet with this system, depending on how much organic load there is inside there. So this is one of their largest systems. A lot of these systems are using the oil field for cleaning up water processes as well. Next slide shows the outside temperatures throughout the field test. When we place our heat coupons for our seven-day test, the temperature outside was about 55 degrees for a high down to 40. And you can see the temperature drop down throughout the week. We had a high over in the mid-30s when we got a snowstorm coming through and then climbed back up into the 60s when we placed our corn dioxide coupons. The other thing about this slide is to note we wanted to harvest or extract the coupons from both of these processes at the same time. So we placed the chlorine dioxide fumigation coupons right near the sixth day of the heat treatment process. So when the heat treatment coupons were done, we could also extract the chlorine dioxide coupons from the bones and then send those to the lab. Uh, we were very concerned about loss of coupons through the FedEx system. So the coupons were driven to two separate labs from Iowa. One, one of the labs was down in Texas, and the separate was in Montana. Heat treatment process was seven days. The chlorine dioxide fumigation was roughly a day. That was just the fumigation, not the preparation. Going to the next slide goes over some of the results we achieved. This is for the subtlest spores uh, on the different substrates. Right now, I'm showing you black iron, galvanized steel, and pine wood. The top part of the photo of the slide shows for the heat treatment process, and the bottom photo part of the slide is for the chlorine dioxide process. So you can see the solid bars that are dark are for the soil coupons, and the clean coupons, the clean substrates are just the clear bars. Starting with the heat treatment process, we saw a very negligible uh, decrease in the subtlest, which we wouldn't expect for the spore formers. Spore formers, you typically have to get up to around 140 to 160 degrees to activate those, and that's uh, there's an aeroclave process, and they typically hold that 
high temperature, high humidity for about four days. And here we're only operating 120 degrees or less. We didn't expect to see a decrease with the spore formers. Chlorine dioxide, on the other hand, is very good against spores. We saw about a six log reduction across the board, some of them a seven log reduction for chlorine dioxide process on these coupons. A little bit better on the clean coupons versus the soil coupons, which we would expect. The, again, the organic material will uh, create a demand for the chlorine dioxide and decrease the concentration. You have to overcome that demand by pumping an additional chlorine dioxide. Going to the next slide is for subtleness on the plastic canvas belt material and concrete. Here again, similar results to what we saw for the previous three substrates. Very little efficacy on the spores on using heat treatment and then a six to seven log reduction with chlorine dioxide. Next slide is for the MS2 bacteriophage for again for the heat and chlorine dioxide. One of the things we saw, so here you'll see the bars going in the opposite direction, is that we saw a decrease in our controls under the conditions that were stored. So for the MS2 sitting, we saw two, three, four log reduction just by sitting inside the environmental conditions, whereas the heat treatment process actually preserved those coupons or the material on those coupons during that process. So that's why the bars are going the opposite way. For chlorine dioxide, we saw a reduction for the soil coupons. Here again, we did the controls we weren't able to evaluate because we saw a reduction just by sitting under the environmental conditions. Similar thing on the next slide for the MS2 on the plastic uh, canvas material and then the concrete. For the heat treatment process, we did see a little bit of reduction on the cotton canvas and then a three to five log reduction with the chlorine dioxide. That was one of the challenges was keeping the control concentrations up during the seven days. There was a natural degradation just by holding them with the environmental conditions where of the 10 degrees C with 60% humidity. Uh, the next slide shows the organic material that was present in both barns. It wasn't just the heat treatment barn. There was a little bit of crud you can see hanging on. They, they've been cleaned very well. But there still was a little bit of organic material hanging off of these barns. These barns were roughly 25 years old, so there was a little bit of damage and corrosion in each of these barns before we even started. Next slide shows the barn after chlorine dioxide fumigation. One of the things that was noticeable was the bleaching effect of the chlorine dioxide on the surface <laughs> in there. And it Can you all mute your phones? There we go. Uh, the bleaching effect of the chlorine dioxide, almost uh, the lights on the left side of the figure almost appeared that somebody had came out and changed the yellow uh, CFL bulbs and put in brand new bulbs on them. The wood was also bleached. It looked like somebody went to Home Depot and replaced all the wood with, with new material. The corrosion, it was difficult to assess because there's already a lot of corrosion in these barns. That is one of the downsides with the chlorine dioxide process. We've done a lot of material compatibility studies looking at the impact of chlorine dioxide. It will oxidize all mild stills and it will start to attack some of the stainless stills. That's what you have to be careful, especially the newer generation of barns. These did not have elaborate control systems such as they had several California barns adjacent to these that they showed us. And that would be one of my concerns with fumigation of chlorine dioxide of these, of these barns is assessment before and after the control systems inside these barns because the chlorine dioxide will have a tendency to attack those. But these barns, we did, we did not see any material impacts that were not already there. That is pretty much the presentation. I don't know if anybody has any questions or anything I can clarify for you. Hi, Shannon. This is Lori Miller. Um, I just want to say thank you for, number one, agreeing to talk to us on such short notice and while you were out in the field. And secondly, for such a great presentation. Um, thank you for that. I, I do have one uh, clarification, though. So as a result of these tests, 
Do you conclude that the heat treatment was not effective on the viruses, uh, the virus surrogate, or was it a matter of the controls that skewed the results? We, we did not really see much of an impact on MS2 bacteriophage. And I'm not a microbiologist, but one of the things we were tossing around, what is the appropriate surrogate for HPAI? And that's one of the things we were looking at. And MS2 was the most stable organism that we could find. There may be better things out there, but the panel, we had people from EPA, we have USDA people on the planning, as well as SABRE looking at their own preparation. They're interested in developing some kind of a, a bioindicator that could be used in these barns to assess whether the process, whether it be heat or corn dioxide, was effective. And they're looking at different surrogates for that. But we did not see much of a decrease with MS2 with the heat treatment process now. Okay. And so we don't know whether that's because the surrogate was not representative of AI or whether it was because exactly. AI wouldn't be susceptible to heat. Exactly. And that's more of a uh, microbiologist question, where I'm okay. more of an engineer. And I have to rely on them to tell me what's the appropriate surrogate for this, and they'll do the comparison studies in the lab and, and tell me. Sure. Thank you. Hey. Hey, this is um, um, Shannon. Hey, this is John Zach from Veterinary Services. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Good. I just want to um, thank you for this work. It's really great. I guess I just want to, you know, point out that the heat treatment was used on 26 premises successfully during the outbreak, and that the heat treatment is just one part of an overall uh, short-term following. The average days that a premises was from start to finish was about 87 days for commercial. Um, in addition to whether any treatment we do, whether it's wet disinfectant, uh, heat treatment, or if we ever use it again, chlorine dioxide, the premises also need to sit for a minimum of one incubation cycle, 21 days. Um, so, you know, the idea that we're going to disinfect the barn and walk away from it, the other huge part of this is the environmental temperature, whether you're in the summer, the winter, the spring, and the minimum amount of days that we've established is 21 days. I also want to point out that, you know, whether, you know, it was just the environment killing the virus, the virus dying because it wanted to die, whatever reason. The, the heat treatment did work on 26 premises, and the, the chlorine dioxide did not work on any one premises. So the actual field application of it did not work. The other thing I would encourage EPA to do is go visit with the premises owner to, for a follow-up on the damage they are claiming. I'm not going to speak for them. I'm just going to say, but if you're interested in a real-world application and what the owner of the premises felt like has happened to them, you should really go talk to them. Can you, can you send me, I assume it's different than the facilities we tested at. I'm not sure which one used. No, I'm talking about the, the one, I'm talking about the one premises that, that the chlorine dox was partially used on during the 2015 outbreak. Yeah, if you could send me that info, I'd be interested in seeing that. Okay. Because that, that, that is one of our concerns with the chlorine dioxide fumigation is it does have the material compatibility issues. Hey, that evidently there's there's issues with electrical equipment. Yep, yep. And these egg layers have hundreds of thousands of dollars of circuit breakers, whatever you call them, of, you know, circuit breakers and steroids. Yep. They, they supposedly have a lot of uh, temperature and RH sensors in there, too. Those are the other things I'd be concerned about. These barns were very basic barns, the ones we tested out. This is a follow-up. Back in 15, um, there was one company nationally approved to do this. Are there any other companies nationally approved to do this? I mean, approved to do it in, like, a farm setting. That are registered to do chlorine dioxide? Back in 2015, the one company was EPA. They had done all the, the work, 
the you know EPA required that they could basically do this on arm on farm setting. Um, Sabre was the only company you know the EPA. I mean, other folks do chlorine dioxide treatments, but no other company was approved to do this. You know, like an on farm treatment, like treating so a building. Sabre's like, the, yeah, Sabre's the only company that has a registration for their product. Chlordysis is another company, but they they would not be able to generate the concentration needed for this large of a volume. That would be one of the concerns. They can do small sure. lab type settings, but nothing like no large scale generation. Yeah, I was just interested if that you know if the marketplace had voted to more people trying to you know develop that capability. So thank you. Sabres kind of has the market on this area because of our generation process. Their patented process. Oh no, and it's a great contingency thing to have because God knows if we ever get like a bowl in pigs. No, oh, exactly. That's the way we look. You know, at I mean, our, you never say never. You know, I'm, I'm not there at all. I'm like, yeah, thank God we have, you know, different uh, capabilities for different situations. Absolutely, we're same situation for us. We look at. And now hydrogen peroxide, methyl bromide, each one has its pros and cons for each application. So does anybody else have any questions for Shannon? All right, Shannon. Thank you very much for for joining us. I, I, you know, I'll echo Laurie's thanks. Thanks for joining us on uh, such short notice uh, and, and for a great presentation. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Shannon, very much. Bye bye. Bye. Um, so, <clears throat> um, why don't we go through and first off, before we go through everyone and and you know talk about what everyone wants to talk about um, real quick. Um, I heard from Brian Dimeke, the training and exercise program has their monthly meeting uh, the first Monday of, or sorry, the first Wednesday of the month. And that conflicts with our call. And so of course, a lot of their folks can't join us. Um, so we, you know, I talked, Laurie and I talked and uh, Unless anyone has objections, we're going to have our call every Wednesday except for the first Wednesday of the month. Any objections? All right, hearing none, we'll, we'll set that up. Um, why don't we go through and uh, see if uh, anyone has any you know, what everyone wants to talk about. Dr. Zach? Laurie? Um, the only thing I wanted to mention is um, what I had mentioned earlier today on the High Path AI call, so apologies to those who've, who are hearing it twice. Um, we have just graduated our second class of um, people from Compost School at the University of Maine. Um, this was 20 people. Six of them were from APHIS, and uh, the other 14 were from um, various states, North Carolina, Arkansas, Nebraska, uh, Florida, Georgia, uh, Puerto Rico, and Canada. That's all I have to report. Good deal. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Andy? Uh, I don't really have anything for the group today, um, but I very much enjoyed the presentation as well. Good deal. Thank you, sir. Um, Carter? Patty? Nothing else for me, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jeff? Lynn? No, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Scott? All right, uh, Beth? Nothing, nothing today, nothing today. Okay, thank Thanks. you, sir. 
Beth? Frederick? And Julie? I, um, one other thing that I, you know, I, I like to share, um, I think as, as a lot of y'all know, um, we've got a, we've currently got a New World Screw Worm um, outbreak, I guess outbreak is the right word, in the Florida Keys. And as part of the response to that, it looks like we will probably be sending two hurricane incinerators down there um, to help with disposal. So that should be a, a pretty decent real world test of them. Although I think um, Laurie and Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, the volume that they're gonna be having to handle in the keys isn't nearly as much as they would during um, an HPAI or particularly an FMD outbreak, but it's still a decent real world test. So, Drew, according to, according to Chris Young this morning, I think about the maximum daily input would be uh, about 2,000 pounds. So, And um, those are rated for up to, what, about 40 or 50? So that's a ton, a ton per day. Uh, um, that's what they're providing. But what is the capacity of the hurricanes? About 20, 30 tons per day? Yes, I believe that's correct, and I, and I need to correct it. It's actually uh, about 4,000 pounds, up to 4,000 pounds maximum that they'd be uh, uh, using in animal park. So uh, about a tenth of the, of the capacity of, of what they could throughput in a day. Okay, so not a uh, certainly not a maxed out test, but at least a, a field test of using them for disposal. Yeah, yes, that, that's say. wonderful. And um, honestly, that's about all I have today. Um, anybody else have anything for the good of the group today? All right, hearing none, uh, this, uh, the, uh, Shannon's presentation was recorded. So we will, as soon as I get that from Brian, we'll get that up on SharePoint and um, you know, we can share that with everybody else. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.